Okay, let's try this. One, two, three, one, two, three. Is anyone hearing? Is anyone even paying attention? One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me?
Good afternoon, Your Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to everyone, those in the room and those online. Thank you very much for joining us for the IGF 2022 Open Forum, Connecting the Digital Dots, How the UN System is Supporting Digital Transformation and Looking Toward the Global Digital Compact. We have a number of very distinguished speakers with us, both here in the room and online. Um, I am Jean-Paul Ardan, and I'm the Director for Technology, Climate Change, and Natural Resources at the UNECA, and I'll be moderating the session. And we are joined by online Mr. Dong Yu Ku, the Director General of the Food and Agricultural Organization. We are joined by Mr. Junhua Li, the UN Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Mr. Abandik Singh Gill, the UN Secretary General Envoy on Technology. Dr. Cecile Abtel, the Deputy Director of the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, who is on joining us online. Mr. Weishun Chen, the Acting Executive Director of the UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. Dr. Tofik Jelassi, the Assistant Ge Director General for Communication and Information of UNESCO. Ms. Peggy Hicks, the Director for Thematic Engagement Special Procedures and Right to Development at UN OHCHR. We have Mr. Stephen Barrow, the deputy to the director of the ITU Telecommunication Development Bureau, and is joining us online. Mr. Robert Opp, the chief digital officer from UNDP, also online. And Mr. Dino Delaccio, the chief information officer from the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund, and who's here with us in the room on the far right. And Ms. Uh, Hélène Molinier, the senior policy advisor on innovation from UN Women, joining us online. So we have a very distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, we have a large number of people to, to speak. So I will ask everyone to set good examples by being very brief. Uh, but we will start, and we are delighted to be joined by the UN Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Jun Hua Li, who will make a welcome statement. And then we look forward to hearing from the other panelists. So four minutes uh, to you, uh, USG. Well, thank you. I just want to join my colleague from ECA to welcome every colleague from the UN entity to uh, this uh, open dialogue or open forum. Um, I guess um, um, everyone understands the significance and importance to have an open dialogue among all the UN entities participating in the IGF. Um, to UN DESA, to me, we are all um, working on this a very important subject to facilitate the member states uh, for the digital transition and the digital transformation. So then the, we may ask ourselves uh, why we should have this important dialogue, open dialogue among ourselves. Um, to me or to the UN DESA, to the UN Secretariat, we fully understood that uh, now war is facing serious challenges on multiple fronts, uh, from climate change to the uh, public health and the conflict, the regional conflict, or the global conflict and the economic hardship. And then the, we also engaged in all fronts, all these fronts, using our expertise in drawing the digital technologies to counter the impact of the, all those crises. So in that sense, uh, as a global organization, we should share our best practices, 
we have adopted along the way in accelerating the SDGs. But since we are all here and the, to uh, maximize our presence in the IGF de deliberation, I think the IGF is a very unique platform for us um, uh, to engage with the all stakeholders, but above all, we UN entities or the UN team that we need to be uh, engaged ourselves. So from that perspective, we believe that uh, uh, 2.7 billion people remained unconnected, globally speaking. And also uh, more importantly, being connected is not sufficient enough. So the critical thing is the vulnerable groups are empowered to meaningfully use the digital technologies. Therefore, that we must to synergize our efforts from different fronts. That's why that we attach the great importance to this uh, UN NED dialogue. I look forward to hear, hearing from our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, and the Secretary General, and for setting such a wonderful example from being within time. And so I have the pleasure to go to first to our panelist, Mr. Amandeep Singhil, at the UNSG Special Envoy on Technology. And we want to hear from each panelist on the highlights of their organizations in advancing uh, ICTs and supporting um, uh, digital uh, transformations uh, in uh, the various countries and where the UN is, is active, and particularly in the context of developing these synergies. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello. So uh, there are many colleagues who will speak after me about specific areas of uh, activities uh, from their uh, perspective. I just want to give a high level overview. Uh, I think the UN is active at two levels on the digital transformation. Uh, from the perspective uh, of the UN Secretary General, the Secretariat, uh, there is the level of having absolute clarity on what's the right approach in terms of seizing the opportunities while managing the risks. So a lot of effort has gone into that over the past five years, the high level panel on digital cooperation, the roadmap on digital cooperation, now our common agenda report and moving into the global digital compact to help countries think about the digital transformation in an end-to-end -end comprehensive manner. How do we manage it responsibly? How do we make sure that it is inclusive? At the end of the day, our mantra when it comes to the sustainable development goals is leaving no one behind. So the same applies to the digital transformation. So that high level guidance uh, that's been coming out over the past four or five years, and we'll build on that with the global digital compact. The other level is where uh, colleagues in different parts of the UN system in the ITU working very hard to boost connectivity, to build the physical infrastructure, the capacity, the cybersecurity standards, cybersecurity capacity to support uh, that connectivity. Uh, in the UNDP, for instance, uh, uh, very specific concrete areas of contribution uh, to member states uh, based on their needs for instance, during COVID. In the WHO, again, you see a new digital health strategy as of 2018, moving into specific areas where uh, digital technologies can make a difference in terms of universal health uh, coverage. So it's these two levels that are working together for the benefit of uh, member states and all the UN's partners. Thank you so much. And we I think we, we see clearly how the risk and the opportunity are bound together and how we must address that. We'd now like to go um, online to Mr. Dong Yu Q, the Director General uh, for FAO. And we'd like to hear your views on uh, your organization's roles in leading digital transformations. Thank you, moderator. Good afternoon from Rome, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Ecofusis has been heavily affected by the recent shocks from the COVID pandemic and other challenges such as the war in Ukraine and ongoing conflict around the world, as well as by the impact of the climate change. 
which highlighted the fragility of agrofoodsystems and the global consequence of local disruption. Today, close to 1 billion people are at the risk of farming in vulnerable countries and well, the 3.1 billion people cannot afford the health status. This reality forces us to urgently reconsider our priorities and the need for more sustainable, resilient societies. We only have a seven cropping seasons away from the deadline of the 2030 agenda. And we needed to take about X now if we are to reach these objectives. Artificial intelligence interlinked with the science and innovations, digital technology, including the connectivity and data can provide the answers we need. Digital technology have a large potential to reduce the global inequalities. They enable farmers to access information on the price to facilitate the transaction with the intermediary. They help to trace the commodity bridges the gap between the consumers and producers. And they, they can access avoiding storage by moving commodities fast, including through the use of e vouchers and e-commerce, of course. FO is already contributed to the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation by championing digital public goods. Since I come to the uh, FO in 2019, I established a digital FO to, to manage FO, all the business now is uh, paperless. And also we established 1,000 uh, digital value initiatives. And also we put the, all the villages set a good examples for digital transformation of agro-food systems. If a new dedicated digital engine, digital for impact, will ensure the rapid scaling up of the digital capabilities in support of transformation of ecosystems through the better and more timely access to real time, actionable information, second, sustainable engagement with the farmers and the stakeholders to maximize the benefit from new technology. Three, improve the access to the market, the credit and insurance. Four, access to digital enabling climate change, smart and cultural solutions. And now we establish a uh, digital solutions for a small island state in Asia Pacific. It's open and uh, to the, all the members. And the five, the enhanced digitalization, emergency interaction and the social protection mechanism. Here, colleagues, FAO, we are now just to just to let board. you know, uh, Director General, that we're a little bit tight on time. So if you could uh, wrap up in about thirty seconds, that'd be ideal. Okay, that's good. It's more than enough. So digital world, we depend on digital economy, agroecology, digital governance, and digital society. So the FAO will be take a leading role for the global transformation of agro food system for better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director General. We really appreciated that link between the adoption of digital transformations and the fight against climate change, where uh, particularly here in Africa, uh, agriculture is the front line. Uh, we now have the great pleasure to go to Dr. Cecile Aptel, the Deputy Director for the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, who will be joining us also online. Uh, Dr. Cecile, over to you, and if we could remain within two minutes. Thank you. Certainly, and thank you very much. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, UNIDIR, the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, produces independent research on disarmament and international security issues, and also supports multilateral negotiations in these areas. And as such, UNIDIR has been actively involved in the topic of international ICT security for several years. Our contribution take takes various forms and our activities cover many interconnected topics to help UN multilateral efforts to maintain peace and security as they are related also to ICTs. Our most recent activities have focused on three areas of action. One, we support the operationalization of the framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. UNIDIR is part of the team that supports the chair of the ongoing open-ended working group on ICT security. These open-ended working groups made up of member states of the UN started its work last year in 2021 and is mandated to work until 2025. 
In this capacity, we facilitated the regular conduct of two sessions of this group in 2022, supporting dialogue and cooperation among states. In addition, we have conducted specific studies on, each, on issues such as the characterization and attribution of malicious cyber acts, international law and confidence building measures. Two, we strengthen cyber crisis management mechanism. We have designed and conducted virtual and in-person engagement with different regional organizations around the world to better explore the management at the policy level of international cyber incidents with a view to exploring the various policy tools available to member states at the national, regional and international level to manage cyber incidents and de-escalate them rather than let them escalate. Third and last, we contribute to confidence building. We continue to convene multi-stakeholders events on some of the most pressing issues in cyber discussion, such as the protection of critical infrastructure. In addition, we continue to expand a cyber policy portal that is a repository of national cyber security laws as a way of um, helping to build confidence measures between UN member states. Again, these are just some of UNIDIR contributions toward building a more peaceful, safe and secure world offline and online. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdel, and making that uh, link between the work on uh, cybersecurity and, and, and addressing threats uh, with the principle of, of uh, digital transformation. And uh, from that uh, segue, it gives me a great pleasure to go to Mr. Wei Shun Chen, the Acting Executive Director of the UN Counterterrorism Terrorism Executive Directorate. And how does the work of your organization contribute to digital transformation? Thank you. I wish to highlight the following three areas. First, I think the security, development, and human rights are the three catch phrases of the organization. And we should really look at the issue uh, from these three angles, which are uh, mutually complementary and reinforcing. The second area, CITED, has these uh, three uh, key mandates of the Security Council. Namely, uh, we conduct assessments of the member states. Uh, second, we are facilitating delivery of technical assistance. Third, uh, we identify new trends and challenges, as well as uh, effective practices uh, regarding the ICT uh, the security areas. Uh, we have found that there are many needs and also the gaps uh, in this area. Uh, so we have already uh, recommended to the member states to, for consideration of actions, as well, uh, as well for the technical assistance providers uh, for follow-ups. The daily declaration adopted by the committee uh, in India uh, has asked CITED uh, to work in this area, in particular in preparing the non-binding principles uh, covering new trends and challenges, including ICT. The third area, I think the UN should continue uh, to, uh, to intensify its activities uh, and engagements uh, with the three prone uh, 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 approach, which is also the three catchphrases, uh, all of government, all of UN, all of society approach. I think in this regard, uh, the UN Global Counterterrorism Compact with 44 entities and also with CTAT inside should be one of the useful vehicles to address the security issues of the ICT. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chen. And uh, for illustrating how uh, counterterrorism goes beyond simply dealing with threats, um, I, I, you mentioned assist, assess, assist, identify, and I think this is going to be key to our work on digital transformation. Um, I would now like to go to Dr. Tofik uh, Jalassi, the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information uh, at uh, UNESCO. Uh, and we would love to hear from you on the uh, work that UNESCO has been doing on digital transformation. Thank you. As you know, UNESCO is a specialized UN agency in charge of, at least the mandate says, building peace in the mind of men and women. How we do that? By promoting the free flow of information and ideas with multiple stakeholders, civil society, the 193 member states, academia, research institutions, uh, and other key partners. Uh, we have been advocating for a human-centered approach to technology development and use, and we have been uh, 
promoting the Rome X uh, framework the four letters stand for a human rights, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder approach dealing with uh, cross-cutting issues. Uh, to date, 44 countries have used the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators to conduct national digital assessment. Uh, contribution is the last year's UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, which is the first normative instrument of its kind in the field of AI. Uh, more recently, a uh, competency framework on AI and digital transformation for civil servants and public sector organizations, but also uh, capacity building training over 24,000 judges and prosecutors on international standards in human rights, uh, safety of journalists, and the freedom of expression. Let me uh, here conclude by mentioning our next February global conference called Internet for Trust, regulating social media to ensure information is a public good and not a public hazard or public harm. We are doing this through uh, regional and thematic consultations uh, on, on such important issue. Again, how to regulate digital platforms while ensuring freedom of speech online. It's a very thin line. It's a, a quite a challenging balancing act that uh, we are facing. We invite you all to join us in Paris next February for this global conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you've illustrated as well, for example, for developing countries, these emerging technologies, huge opportunity that we have to manage them in the context as well of, of, of risk. Um, delighted now to go to Ms. Peggy Hicks, uh, who will uh, also share with us uh, the perspectives on digital transformations from the perspective of the of UN Human Rights Office. Hey, thanks so much. So happy to be with you. I think the starting point for work of the UN Human Rights Office in this sector is to really emphasize how we see the human rights framework as an essential tool, not a hammer, but a tool that can help states, companies, and civil society in our efforts to navigate the digital world. How do we embed human rights throughout the de design, development, and deployment of tech? Now, we do that through working with all, all of the sectors, a multi-stakeholder approach, if you will, with governments, with business, and with civil society. With governments, part of what we're looking at is how we can provide technical assistance and support to allow them to address some of the critical challenges that they face in regulating artificial intelligence and its impacts on privacy, um, or for example, the impacts of online content regulation on freedom of expression. Those are tough questions, as my colleague just mentioned, um, and we have, we hope, useful guidance developed through working through the various models, and but looking for very much context-specific approaches. We also think that guardrails can be set through human rights about how we use digital technology in particularly sensitive human rights um, sensitive areas, such as in law enforcement um, or in the delivery of essential public services like social protection and health. Um, we're also looking at meaningful connectivity and the need to end internet shutdowns as part of that. With businesses, we're working to make sure they live up to their obligations under the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And we have a BTEC project that engages with the major companies across these platforms um, and looking at how they can do their homework in terms of investigating and mitigating human rights risks before they happen, so a preventive approach. Um, we're looking at expanding that project and are, are developing a, a BTEC Africa approach uh, for this year as well. And finally, we believe that civil society has an absolutely crucial role to play in this, and we want space for them. So that means protecting online space, accessing digital security and technology for them, and making sure that we all do our part in making uh, the digital online space a place where they can engage safely without threat of intimidation or reprisal based on their engagement online. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hicks. And we, uh, we we have heard very clearly on how we can't address digital transformations without human rights and in a manner which is inclusive and, and protecting uh, the rights of all individuals. Um, we'll go to Mr. Stephen Barrow, the Deputy to the Director of ITU Telecommunication Development, who will be joining us online uh, from ITU. Um, uh, St uh, Mr. Stephen Barrow, if we can hear from you the role of ITU in uh, promoting digital transformations. 
Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as the UN specialized agencies for ICTs with uh, 155 or more than 155 years of history, ITU builds on its technical expertise, which has been trusted for more than 15 decades to make possible the networks and services that have ensured that initially telephones, then telecommunications, transitioning to ICTs, and now digital are safe, secure, and effective enablers across all of our member states. We've just concluded our 2022 plenipotentiary conference and a key outcome established that sustainable digital transformation, joining our universal connectivity mandate as central pillars for ITU's new strategic plan for the coming years. We recognize that everyone together must get serious about finding a rapid way to bridge our chronic digital divides and to ensure safe, secure connectivity as a foundation for global digital transformation for everyone everywhere. As we emerge from the last few years of lockdowns and attendant physical disconnectedness, digital has come to lie at the core of every single facet of our societies, every sector, every industry, and every government services. And concurrently, the lack of access to digital networks and services, or the inability to use those through lack of digital skills or economic means, is creating a new underclass that ITU's latest data reveals almost 2.9 billion people are still offline and 96% of those live in the world's low income nations. Those digitally excluded risk never being able to catch up. But we recognize that this needs collaboration. So recently we launched in 2021, our partner to connect digital coalition with the aim of catalyzing action and commitment around universal connectivity. The pledging platform connected to that attracted connectivity commitment so far with more than US $29 billion and through more than 550 pledges from private companies, governments, UN agencies, and NGOs, and the broader international development community. Some other partnerships, because partnerships is key to the future, include GIGA, which is an ambitious partnership we have with the UNICEF to connect every school on the planet to the internet. And I also wanna mention the World Summit on the Information Society, which pro with the process for which is an excellent example of digital cooperation within the UN system that already exists, in the global effort to achieve the sustainable digital development goals through the implementation of ICT and digital related action lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barrow. Uh, we appreciate your highlighting the digital divide and the need to address it. And I think there's nowhere more relevant for us to speak about this than in Africa. Um, we would now like to move to Mr. Robert Opp, the Chief Digital Officer of UNDP, who's also joining us online. And we'd love to hear from you, Mr. Opp, on how a UNDP is leading these digital transformations. Thank you very much uh, for having me on the panel. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, you know, I think the COVID-19 pandemic was a watershed moment for us, like many others, where we realized just how important the digital divide was in terms of being an impediment to development. And there's no question now that we all see digital technologies as crucial for the future of development. It also brought a better understanding of some of the risks that have been mentioned by other speakers like misinformation, data privacy, human rights online. So really areas of the organization. It's about how do we build digital into our programming, whether it's in climate action, uh, governance work, et cetera. It's really understanding how to do that. We've supported hundreds of digital solutions in well over a hundred countries and our network of 92 accelerator labs on the ground are, are also helpful for this. Um, when it comes to then looking more holistically at digital transformation, we're working with over 40 countries on what does whole of society digital transformation look like? Um, so for example, it might be doing a readiness assessment for digital work. It might be doing a digital strategy development or a, a national digital compact, which we've done in countries like Mauritania, Moldova, Lebanon, and many others. Um, and there's one last thing that I would like to highlight, which is uh, hasn't come up really in this conversation, although I know it's in others which is around how can we start to move toward building a community among countries on sharing and reusing the, the digital approaches and architectures uh, that are available. So it's 
looking at how do we build a network and a global community of digital public infrastructure that leverages digital public goods and really allows us to work uh, to, together as a community. Um, and with this, we're working with organizations like the Digital Public Goods Alliance, the Tech Envoys Office, our partners at ITU, the Gates Foundation and others. And we're currently working in about 15 countries right now in scaling up these architectures. So just a few things out there in terms of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Opp. And uh, uh, we appreciated you emphasizing this uh, role for uh, national digital compacts and building on that and sharing digital architecture. Uh, I'd now like to go to uh, Mr. Dino Delaccio, the Chief Information Officer from the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund. Um, we'd love to hear from you how we can implement these digital transformations in, this, in the context of your work. Thank you very much. Yeah, I believe and I hope that um, the experience of the UN Pension Fund is an example of uh, how the United Nations practices what it preaches. Internally, in accordance with the UN Secretary General strategy on new technology, the Pension Fund developed its own digital transformation. The most significant outcome of this was in 2021, when we deployed into production a digital identity solution for more than 80,000 beneficiary and retirees of the UN Pension Fund who reside in 193 countries around the world. This initiative address a very critical problem because for the first time, we digitalize the only process that within the pension fund had never been automated. It basically represented a real digital transformation because for 70 years, retirees and beneficiary of the UN pension fund had to demonstrate that they were still alive in order to continue to receive their payment. However, this process was supported only by a paper-based form, which was annually mailed by the pension fund to the 84,000 individual and by them signed and returned to the pension fund using 193 postal services. I'm sure you can appreciate how this over the year was always prone to a lot of problem. Delays or sometimes no receipt of the certificate, which created situation where the fund was forced to suspend payments. This was a problem that finally we were able to address using the new technologies mentioned by the UN Secretary General in his strategy. We use biometrics, specifically facial recognition, and we use blockchain. This system allowed to provide four proofs, proof of identity, proof of existence, proof of transaction, and proof of location with the added benefit of also providing proof of imp impact from an environmental point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Delaccio, for this wonderful example, which I think has applications in so many uh, countries looking to undertake digital transformations. Uh, our final speaker in this first round is Ms. Hélène Molinier joining us online from UN Women. And we, we'd love to hear from you on how UN Women are driving these types of digital transformations. Thank you very much. And there are two things that uh, I would like to highlight among the many initiatives implemented by UN Women. And the first one is the Multi-Stakeholder Action Coalition on Technology Innovation for Gender Equality, which was launched last year in Paris at the Generation Equality Forum. And it's a space that for, for appropriation, for exchanging ideas, for exchanging experience, but also for making public commitments. And it has led hundreds of governments, private sector, civil society, and UN organization to join forces and see how we could uh, have a greater impact and boost meaningful connectivity for women and girls that are the most at risk of being left behind by the digital transformation. And so we've seen countries make concrete commitment to bridge this gender digital divide, but also to build more inclusive innovation ecosystem, to develop gender responsive technology and to fight tech facilitated gender-based violence. And much of this work is now influencing the preparation of the Commission on the Status of Women, CSW, which will take place in March next year on this very topic. And it's the first time the Commission will holistically review the theme of innovation and technology from a gender perspective. And so it's an incredibly important step to shape the global normative framework um, in this area. 
We are working now with member states, with civil society partners, in the hope that this will be the occasion to send strong messages, especially on the need to explore new avenues to adopt human-centric and gender-responsive approach to digitalization, uh, a much greater focus also on feminist principles of inclusion, of intersectionality, and of systemic change. And so for this occasion, we have uh, gathered together more than 45 experts who have prepared expert papers on the subject. They will be all put online next week and hopefully will be helpful for the community. They cover a wide range of topics with a gender perspective, especially uh, you will find analysis of the gender dimensions of the a digital um, divide, you will uh, look uh, at solutions to address stereotypes in uh, STEM education. Uh, it looks Just also to let you know, Ms. Melinier, that we, we are at, at time, so maybe I can give you 30 seconds to complete. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so this paper cover also digital finance um, services, artificial intelligence, and, and, uh, and many others. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry, we just have, want to have a second round and uh, we really appreciated these, this insight into the gender dimensions. Uh, we now have a, a, an opportunity in this second round to go to the panelists to get their perspectives on how the whole of the UN system can work together to support the vision uh, outlined by the Secretary General uh, in the Global Digital Compact. Um, and I'd like to start with Mr. Amandeep Singh Gill uh, to hear your thoughts and I'd invite each panelist uh, if we can remain within time to focus on perhaps one thing, because then we can put that together uh, as uh, one of the outcomes as part of the UN delivering on this very important instrument. I think we have two very important events coming up in 2023, the midterm review of the SDGs, and in 2024, uh, the summit of the future, uh, at which a global digital compact has been proposed uh, to be adopted. Uh, this is a unique opportunity for different UN organizations who, as you've heard today, are doing commendable work, both on the opportunity side, but also on managing the risks and addressing some of the misuse, uh, to come together and uh, present uh, a more compelling and more ambitious set of uh, initiatives to member states. Uh, for instance, I think we need uh, an end-to-end -end vision, a common blueprint, of sorts on the digital transformation, which combines the capacities, the assets of different UN organizations and makes them available at the country level uh, for the benefit of member states. Similarly, we need to move to the next stage of deploying data for addressing specific SDGs, the green transition, agriculture, food security, health. So pooling data together in line with the commons vision, the digital commons vision, the data commons uh, uh, vision that the SG has uh, laid out. And finally, the global digital compact is an opportunity to refresh our thinking on norms, on principles, shared principles, uh, that can then be landed in the practice of both governments and other stakeholders so that the digital transformation works for everyone and respects human rights and uh, uh, human agency. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Secretary General. And I'm delighted now to go to Mr. Dong Yu Q uh, from FAO online uh, to get your thoughts on what is the priority to deliver on the Global Digital Compact. Uh, Mr. Dong Yu Q, uh, perhaps, uh, okay, it seems like we. Um, we have uh, lost you for now, so we'll go to Dr. Cecile Aptel, uh, also online. Um, what is the priority for delivering on the digital compact? Thank you. Um, I mean, there are several priorities, and, and, and one of them is to really keep the cyber domain safe. And we've seen so that there can then be the maximization of the potential for member states in um, cyber transformation and digital transformation. I think it's important to really um, see that UN, the UN system entities can work together in support of the Global Digital Compact, and in fact, they do work together. I will give you just um, three short examples of such collaborative work UNIDI has undertaken over the last few months in the areas of cyber security and cyber stability. 
One, in collaboration with UNITA, we have organized capacity building programs that bring together virtually some 50 participants each time, mostly from developing countries to discuss and cover cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. Two, in collaboration with UNDPPA, we have studied the cyber dimensions of ongoing conflict and their impact. Three, um, UNIDIA is an active member of the UN Cyber Hub, an interagency coordination group through which we have facilitated briefing on digital technologies in the context, for instance, of security sector reform initiatives, showing the, the breadth of, of um, uh, digital issues and how the UN can work together. Maybe just to conclude overall, UN collaboration toward the global digital compact is crucial to maintain peace and security in the cyber domain, because responsibly managing this domain requires a multi-stakeholders and also a multidisciplinary approach. Together, we can reach different stakeholders and therefore a wider audience, utilize and combine the different strengths of all involved UN entities so as to best support member states maximize safely the full potential of digital transformation for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cecile. And uh, it's been interesting to see how those different strands uh, come together. Um, moving on to Mr. Wei Shun Chen, uh, we'd like to hear from you how uh, your organization uh, sees the priority for the Global Digital Compact. Thank you. I think for the security aspect, uh, see that together with the other entities of the UN Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact, uh, we'll be able to uh, invest heavily uh, I think, into this exercise. Uh, however, there are two issues I wish to stress that the, uh, with the enhanced synergy and information sharing among UN country teams and the, uh, the UN resident coordinator's office with the UN entities at the headquarters, we, we will be able uh, to make progress. The second one is that they, we must try our best to avoid duplication repetition, competition among the UN uh, family entities uh, because we need to strengthen uh, our common but differentiated uh, efforts in order to achieve uh, the vision as described by the Sugar Journal uh, for his, I think, uh, as in the Global Digital Compact. In this regard, I think the, the beauty of the UN family is that the entities within one UN family, they have their own respected but also different function of the entity, which will help uh, to achieve uh, the objective of the, uh, the global digital housing compact. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that that role of ensuring that information flows freely within ourselves is the first step towards uh, ensuring that it flows outside as well. Uh, Dr. Jalassi, um, from your perspective, um, what, what would be the main interventions required for the global digital compact? Uh, I mentioned earlier our work on the internet universality indicators, our Rome approach, uh, our forthcoming regulatory uh, conference on digital platforms. These are some specific projects that we believe uh, can uh, serve as inputs to the global digital compact. More broadly, we be, 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 besides, of course, our work with the Office of the UN Tech Envoy, we have been working with ITU within the context of the UN Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, with the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, on Freedom of Speech, on Safety of Journalists, on Ending Impunity for Crimes Committed Against Media Workers, uh, with uh, uh, UN DESA uh, on uh, the International Decade on Indigenous Languages, which you are, we are launching on December 13. And this goes from 2022 to 2032. So a number of key projects, which we believe are impactful with other UN entities. I think the common denominator is how can we really uh, apply human rights online? How can we contribute to creating a code of, co a code of conduct uh, for public information integrity? How can we create the global digital compact to ensure an open, safe, accessible, and free internet? And to conclude, I think the coordination, as it was uh, mentioned a minute ago, the coordination within the UN family is critical for all of us in order to speak with one voice. We are not in competition, for sure we are not. We are complementary to each other. 
and we should, should really ensure that one plus one equals three, not two. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jalassi. I think we are all multipliers. We're aiming to multiply our efforts, and I think you've put that extremely well. Uh, over to Ms. Six. From the uh, human rights uh, perspective, um, how do we deliver on human rights through the Global Compact? Thank you. Uh, broadening the question a bit, just how we deliver on as the UN on, on global digital rights and, and how we can input into the compact. Um, I think the, the most important starting point is around the engagement of civil society within the process. Um, this is an area where we've learned a lot in the last few years during COVID and we need to learn more, but we need to ensure meaningful participation and for meaningful participation to happen, we have to live up to our responsibilities to provide protection as well. Um, and we need to really work at how we do that. And we've seen that in the context of other global conferences um, and work, and there's, there's more that can be done. The second point I make is that I think we as the UN system have to look at how we, how we are setting good models that can be brought into this process. And that involves, of course, human rights due diligence within the UN system in terms of our actions regarding digital technologies. And we're uh, leading an interagency group right now that's working on how we can deliver better on, um, on that work uh, under a mandate from the Secretary General, looking at how we can all make sure that we are using digital technologies in a way that respects and um, uh, eliminates human rights risks from digital technologies. We have a session on that later in the here. And third, you won't be surprised to hear me say, we need to look at and make sure that we are speaking as one voice. I appreciate the points made on that, particularly in my uh, case with regard to how we bring in human rights into the process and make sure that we are not in our own actions trying to undersell or underemphasize it, but looking at how human rights can be a valuable tool that can be used within the process to create a strong and effective UN engagement within the Global Digital Compact. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that we're all looking to make sure that this is a, this is a reality. Uh, going to Mr. Stephen Biro on online, um, from the ITU perspective, um, what is priority in terms of delivering on the Global Digital Compact? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, my, my first statement would be that what is priority is us all committing to the Global Digital Compact. You know, this rec represents a recognition by the UN Secretary General of the importance of digital to our future and the impossibility for the engagement or our engagement in any one sphere to encompass the true breadth of the challenge before us. Our common agenda has the potential to be the true game changer toward a safe, secure and inclusive digital future for all. Um, at ITU, we've done a lot of work on how to achieve digital transformation, but one thing is crystal clear. Collaboration between different actors involved is critical, and only by aligning our expertise across the UN can we even hope to help governments, civil society, and industry and people to drive the collaborative effort that will achieve transformation. For this, though, we need to agree on and build a framework that enables us all to co cooperate more effectively, both internally within the UN and within all, with all stakeholders so that we can build digital societies at a national and global level. And I, I really think the Global Digital Compact provides this. So at ITU, we've traditionally brought together stakeholders, many stakeholders, our own membership is, is built on a, as a multi-stakeholder group. Um, but we want to, to help lead and help this development of digital to be a glue that binds us all and takes us forward as a larger, fairer, and more inclusive whole. Uh, I mentioned some of our specific initiatives like WSIS, Partner to Connect, and GIGA, but we have have we are firmly committed that partnership and collaboration is the way. So we're seeking to work closely with, I see the UN Tech Envoy on this panel and his office to share what we've learned from our own work and to help that office to define and devise ways that the UN can press forward with a more collective approach. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this collective approach I think has been demonstrated already on this panel, but I think there's also a recognition that there's a lot for us to do, uh, and we're determined to make that happen. Um, moving to Mr. Robert um, Opp um, from UNDP's uh, perspective on speaking online, um, what for you is the, the first thing we do to deliver on this digital compact? Thank you, Jean-Paul. I hope you can hear me this time. I understand there were some technical difficulties last time. and uh, uh, It was only for 30 seconds, so okay. it was not so bad. Well, I assure you those 30 seconds were the most profound statements that you would have heard all day, but uh, anyway, I'm sure that they'll be okay. 
Um, so I, I think, you know, the Global Digital Compact is really our big opportunity of this generation to unite us behind common principles that are shared in multiple stakeholder groups, right? So it also allows us in the UN system to match the normative work being done with the field implementation. And so some of the panelists have talked about, you know, digital rights and what that means and um, that kind of level, but really making it translate on the ground is where we would put the em emphasis in terms of UNDP's effort in this. So it's really a joint effort. The thing, the point that I would make is that every country in the world is building their digital infrastructure right now. And they will either do that in a way that is inclusive and responsible and behind these sort of common principles that we're talking about, supported by a coherent and efficient and effective UN system, or they'll find another way of doing that. And so this really is, I think, needs to be the kind of driving purpose behind what we in the UN do in working in partnership uh, to not be fragmented, but rather be coherent and strategic in our approach in really looking toward inclusive digital transformation that leaves no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate how much the 30 seconds matter when each person is only speaking for less than two minutes. Um, but to, uh, I think you've underlined a very critical point in particular, I think in Africa where we are building infrastructure while doing the regulations at the same time. And that requires a specific type of support that I think the UN uh, must adapt to be able to deliver. And I think there are good examples of where we're able to do so. And we appreciate UNDP's role on the ground in that context. Uh, moving to uh, Mr. Dino Delaccio, uh, to hear from you, and we really appreciate the previous example, uh, the practical example from the UN Pension Fund, and how you see uh, the role of your organization in delivering in this uh, global digital compact. Thank you. I will mention four elements. So first and foremost, to celebrate success. We are very pleased that be the recipient of the United Nations Secretary General Award on Innovation and Sustainability. This in turn uh, gave me the privilege to lead a working group on digital transformation within a body that exists across the UN, the Digital Technology Network. We created a specific working group on digital transformation to define together all the CIOs of the various UN entity, going back to the comment that we made before, to avoid duplication, to share best practices, to define what success is, and to also identify key performance indicator to be measured and to report to our stakeholders and governing body. Third, we have a common denominator within the UN system. In implementing and developing this solution, we work very closely with the United Nations International Computing Center. The UNICC has a mandate to provide ICT support and services across the UN system. And this, in our case, was very beneficial. Indeed, this solution developed at the UN JSPF gave input to a wider, broader solution. We are now working together with other five UN entities, UNICR, UNDP, World Food Program, and UNICEF. We are working on creating the UN digital ID for all UN staff around the world. And this is also being recognized as meeting at least four of the eight principle of the Global Digital Compact. For example, digital inclusion, strengthening digital capability building, protecting human rights in this specific case, digital identity, demonstrating how the physical legal identity can and should be recognized also in the digital world, and finally, creating and building digital trust by using, for example, new technology such as a blockchain that creates immutable evidence and record of the transaction that uh, has been established and processed. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that's a great recipe. Celebrate success and replicate in, and at scale. Uh, moving to Ms. Helene Molinier uh, online uh, to hear from UN Women. Um, in terms of your perspectives on what a successful global digital compact looks like. Thank you. One of our priorities for the global digital compact is to foster multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, and what we have already launched is a joint statement and we launched it at the General Assembly last September and it has now been endorsed by more than 60 stakeholders 
and really calling on partners to place um, gender equality at the heart of the Global Digital Compact. And we're really humbled by the by the support that it has received. It sends very clear messages, both on the process and on the content that we hope to see endorsed and making sure that there will be a, a participatory and inclusive development approach and, and making sure women and marginalized voices will be fairly represented um, in the preparation. Um, what we've seen at UN Women is that it, it, it's really important uh, to bring people together for the CSW work. We have more than 15 UN entities that have been coming together and prepared the SG report that will be used for the negotiation. And it's a first, and we see that it really enriched the development uh, of the report and it's hopefully making um, this type of document and then the type of norms that will come out of it very much relevant across sector and useful uh, as a building block to the compact. Um, so as I mentioned, the joint statement uh, is covering a wide range uh, of priorities that we hope to see uh, including and put forward. And our role at UN Women is to make sure that uh, we'll bring people together, champion this topic, make sure that all uh, our partners will take part to the open consultation that has been launched by the Tech Envoy Office and provide their own individual input to the platform and, and be active uh, participants in the consultation organized. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Molinier. And I think we've been delighted to hear from all of our panelists. Uh, and just perhaps um, as the moderator, I will uh, bring some concluding uh, remarks and I'll, I promise to be within my own rules that everyone has respected with, with such discipline. Uh, and firstly to say, I think this panel was really about the UN challenging itself, uh, challenging, uh, challenging us ourselves to build on what each other is doing, uh, replicate it and scale it and ensuring as well that there is impact on the ground. I think there is also recognition that in some cases uh, we need to be perhaps more, uh, more directly relevant to the needs of our stakeholders, in particular member states, and ensure that the, there is context specific uh, action that can be taken. And addressing this as well in terms of the types of policies uh, that are relevant to the specific needs of, of countries, but which also speak to the universi universality of certain principles, including around uh, human rights. And I think there is a determination for us to bring all our resources together to make the Global Digital Compact uh, something which is an accelerator of implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and allows us to really get back on track. And I think it's very, very symbolic to be having uh, this kind of uh, conversation, this kind of challenge to ourselves uh, here in Addis Ababa at the heart of the African Union, recognizing that if we are to achieve the SDGs, it's about truly transforming African economies, moving away from simply uh, having uh, export of raw resources, but really having transformative impact. And this is through uh, digital transformation. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Everyone told me that it was impossible to have 12 UN panelists and remain within time. We started a little bit late and we actually have ended within the hour that we had set ourselves. Thank you to our panelists. You've done a fantastic job, uh, all of you. And thank you as well to the audience. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm a Saganana. And we will have a photograph. Thank <laughs> you. 